One of the things that's very striking about Britain is the class system. And class is back. People are talking about class again, using these playground words, chavs and toffs. I found that very weird, because I, I wasn't aware of a class system growing up in Ireland. There didn't seem to be a class system, not that I knew about anyway. There just seemed to be everybody. And then there was four people over there who had big houses, but you didn't know them. <laughs> it seems to me British people like the class system. You like to have little boxes to put people in. You know, you like to have aristocrats, people with four sets of teeth. Nobody understands what they're saying. They live in big, drafty houses that smell of wet spaniel. And, then the upper, and they have all the fun with their surnames, because they're called things like Mr. Trazorius Bletchley Sir Single Pukington, <laughs> and so on. And then there's the upper middle class who actually have all the money, and they have all the fun with their first names, because the child is christened or baptised, but it's never called by that name afterwards. It's always known by a nickname. Jaunty, Ning, Nong, Biff, Squiff, Titface, whatever it is. Come on. Come on, we're going skiing again for no reason. Why would anybody want to go skiing? Why, you, you could sit in the comfort of your own kitchen and break your knees with a hammer. Why, what, is, what, is the, what is the human impulse? What's wrong with these people? I think it's because they're so cosseted, their lives are so comfortable, they actually seek out danger as a pastime. If you're poor, you don't go and look for danger because you're surrounded by it. Your accommodation is dangerous, your neighbors are dangerous, your own family are pretty handy, you probably have a couple of moves yourself. Your dinner could fucking kill you anyway, so you don't have to go and look for danger. The dark creates all kinds of things. The dark creates music, particular kinds of music. Horrible folk music you don't want to listen to. And heavy metal, which they love in dark places. They love it in Scandinavia. They have all these metal bands, you know. And they're, they're not like the English ones or the American ones that have names like Metallica and Megadeth and so on. They, they, the names are... Because English isn't their first language in Scandinavia, even though they all speak it, so they call their bands things like Anus Hammer! <laughs> Egg Smuggler! All that stuff. And it's a very interesting look, heavy metal. You know, you have everything down here. You've got jazz and ska and everything, you know, and whatever, folk music too, probably. Folk music has its own look. It has, uh, you know, people wear dungarees because they say, I'm a man or a woman of the people. This isn't my main thing, you know. I'm just like you, really. My main job is harvesting turnips. <laughs> anyway, this next number is called Cross-Eyed Mary of the Lowlands. I'd like to dedicate it to my wife. And then, <laughs> and then there's jazz, you know, where you get people in suits, but they're non-conformist suits because they're wearing a pink shirt with a green jacket and a blue tie and trousers too complex to describe. And... <laughs> Because they're saying, yes, I'm wearing a suit, but I work for me. And my job is to play the electrified tractor horn till five in the morning, so fuck you. <laughs> Heavy metal is a very interesting look. It, the look is a kind of an argument. It's an argument against Darwinism. Because what the people who are involved are saying is that attraction is not necessary for reproduction. <laughs> That's why they shave all the hair off where it would naturally be and cultivate it in places where it shouldn't be. And that's why the music is so angry. You know, if you shave all the hair off your arse and then get into a pair of leather trousers, you're gonna sing an angry song. <laughs> it's not gonna be some wistful ballad about that crazy summer in Paris with Justine. <laughs> it's going to be much more, death in the morning, death for breakfast, little pots of toasted death. And <laughs> heavy metal is what happens when a group of people with competitively disgusting appearances come together to try to kill air. <laughs> People, people go funny in, in middle age, you know. Men go funny. They get into things, you know. They get a hobby. So, yeah, I've always been interested in wood. I just didn't want to say anything until now. <laughs> I need to go and be with my big lump of wood. They get a silly car, you know, a bright-coloured car that nobody else can fit inside so they can pretend they can drive around in their own penis. <laughs> and uh, my thing, what happened to me was I got, I got, I had this period of being addicted to action films, thrillers, modern thrillers, really stupid ones, you know, the stupider the better. Not the old-fashioned uh, kind of James Bond one where he's in a car, you know, and he's got a sharp suit and a lady in a frock is there and he clicks a pen and people's feet fall off and all that stuff. <laughs> Not those, this is a modern one, you know, where you don't know what's going on and neither does the hero. That's the important thing. Everybody has an amnesia in the film. And it begins with him running across the desert, picking numbers out of snakes that have been nailed to cactuses, because that's somehow good to explain who he is and what he's supposed to do. And then suddenly he's on a boat and he kills 19 people with his insoles. 
And then, uh, you know, he finds that he can speak a dozen languages and, he, and he's an amazing pastry chef. He can control condiments by thinking about them. And <laughs> rubbish, in other words. Even better if it's got Jason Statham in it. <laughs> Those films are unimprovably stupid because to begin with him being thrown out of an aeroplane, he's got one wire attached from his heart going to his arse, another one going from his brain to his bollocks, and if he pulls the wrong wire, he swallows his eyes and vomits his liver. <laughs> They're fabulous. Exercises in homicidal manliness. And because that's what's happening to you. you, you, you you're becoming a blob, so you outsource your masculinity. You watch Jason do all this stuff. Go on, Jason, break his other collarbone. I got a parking ticket this morning. And <laughs> You see, he's such a man! Even his lunch sweats. He... <laughs> Most men are what? Nerveless bags of glands, you know? People who... He, Jason makes decisions. M men, most men, me, most men, get polaxed by indecision just walking into pressure motion. <laughs> Not Jason, he pulls the whole fucking circuit board out. That's how much of a man he is, you see? Most men are ambiguous creatures. You can imagine another life for yourself. You could have become a, a library glue wholesaler <laughs> in Worthing. You might have been um, a, 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 a bicycle customizer in the Isle of Wight. You might have been somebody who repaired lighthouses in Cornwall and fallen in love with the local uh, fruit seller in midlife, realized you were gay. And he had been nursing a crush on you for all these years because you'd been going in and out of there buying yams. And then you moved to Andalusia and opened your own small B&B &B with an incredible range of sherries. <laughs> it could happen, you know, but not to Jason. <laughs> Jason could never make love with another man, never. Not unless that man contained information <laughs> that could only be released through the enzymes in spam. See what I'm saying? <laughs>